Well, it's about time for us to get started tonight. We're going to begin in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 24, um, which really, I feel like verse 24 should have been the beginning of chapter 7. Here's an instance where a chapter division should have happened and didn't. Uh, because pretty much everything from 624 all the way to the end of chapter 7 is one story. Uh, but there you go. Um, but before we begin, uh, let's have a word of prayer together. Our eternal Father in the heavens, who is holy and majestic, we thank you for the opportunity we have to read the scriptures this evening and to uh, study them and to learn about your will for our lives. We know, Father, we're looking at stories of a distant past when your people, Israel, dwelt in the land of Canaan. But we are also, Father, looking at at a single story of redemption, one that is still going on today, one that is taking place even within our hearts. And so we pray, Father, that you'll help us to learn from the history of your nation and your people. Help us to learn from their mistakes. Help us to learn how we ought to best conform ourselves to your will. And help us to learn a deep and unyielding respect for your word, your prophecies. We pray, Father, that you will guide us into all truth that you will conform us evermore to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in His name that we pray. Amen. Alright, uh, now uh, for 2 Kings, really this whole section of 2 Kings that we're in, deals primarily with the exploits of Elisha and various miracles that he performs. He performs miracles for the sons of the prophets. He performs miracles for uh, the Gentile leper Naaman and for his servants. In this story, he kind of has a little provision made. Not really, again, we say Elisha's performing the miracles, but it's really God doing them. Elisha is just kind of the agent who predicts them at best. <coughs> but in this instance, uh, we have kind of a break for the king of Israel, which is a little unusual because the king of Israel is a guy who we don't think a lot of in this story. He's Joram. He's evil. He's the son of Ahab. But it starts off with a rather severe siege. And uh, to really just get the impression of this, uh, let's go ahead and read verses 24 through 31 of 2 Kings chapter 6. Can I get a volunteer to read that? Uh, Okay, so you get this siege of Samaria. How bad was it? It was horrible. What uh, what kinds of things are they, are they doing here? They're eating dove droppings. It's not just that they're eating it. It's that they're paying for it. And I mean, they're, they're selling it for five shekels for a fourth of a cob of this dung. It's not a lot. Uh, they're eating donkey's heads, and donkey's heads were un donkeys were unclean animals, and that's like the worst part of a donkey to eat, if you're going to eat any part of the donkey. But it sells for 80 shekels of silver, which is a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, so that's pretty bad. What else are they eating? They're eating themselves. They're eating children, right. Uh, and, you know, you see this picture here of them eating their children and them, you know, being starved to death within this city by this Aramean siege. And you just gotta wonder, does this look like the end for Israel? Yeah, it kinda looks that way. 
I mean, in fact, this story is incredibly similar to another siege story that we see in the Bible. Anybody know which one? Not as heavily detailed on this point, but got to think into the future a little bit. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is very similar to when the Babylonians besieged Judah and tried to starve out the city. The book of Lamentations describes uh, horrifying scenes where they eat their own children in that context of that siege. In Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 describe people eating their children as a curse of the covenant. This looks like the end for Israel. Um, and, I mean, you know, we as a reader might think that, of course, you know, if you know Israel's history and you know the rest of what's happening, you know that it's not the end. But, it's like, imagine reading this for the first time, and you, the reader, are going, this looks like it's over. I mean, the famines, the sieges are often the result of God's judgment. God has previously promised exile for Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 14 and verses 15 and 16, the Lord said to Jeroboam that the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and he will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River because they have made their Asherim provoking the Lord to anger. He will give up Israel on account of the sins of Jeroboam which he committed, and with which he made Israel to sin. Um, more specifically, God has promised judgment on the house of Ahab in 1 Kings 21. In 1 Kings chapter 21, in verses 21 through 26, uh, Elijah confronts Ahab in the vineyard of Naboth and says, I will bring evil upon you and will utterly sweep you away and will cut off from Ahab every male, both bond and free in Israel. Uh, I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger, and because you have made Israel sin. Of Jezebel also does the Lord spoken, saying, The dogs will eat Jezebel in the district of Jezreel. The one belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. The one who dies in the field, the birds of the heaven will eat. Surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel his wife incited him. He acted very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites have done whom the Lord cast out before the sons of Israel. Now Elijah said that back in 1 Kings 21. But has that prophecy really been fulfilled yet? I mean Ahab's dead. Yes. But is everything Elijah said was going to come to pass? Has that happened yet? Hmm? No. What's missing? Well, what's missing? Now, Ahab's house still exists. Joram is still ruling Israel. And so when we read 2 Kings 6, 24-31, and we read this uh, instance where they're being besieged and they're on the brink of death, we think maybe Elijah's prophecy is finally going to come to pass. Maybe we're finally going to see some of these loose ends tied up. But of course, the siege of Samaria, we're going to find out, does not succeed here. Uh, like Assyria's assault on Judah later, the Lord has a different end in mind for his people. And we should also remember that in 1 Kings 19, the Lord told Elijah that he needs to appoint Elisha as his successor, but also Hazael, king of Aram, and uh, Jehu, son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel. Neither of those things have happened yet, either. So we're still kind of, there's still a lot of loose ends in the story we're waiting for. The brutal siege, of course, leads to ridiculous prices for worthless food. The law of supply and demand has forced prices on any kind of food to astronomical highs. And the king, well, he's powerless to help. Um, not in the question handout, but something interesting. You know, this woman comes to the king, and she confronts him with the scenario that says, you know, we had this agreement, me and this other woman, to eat each other's children, and we ate my child, and then she hid her child and reneged on the deal. And does, does that kind of remind us of anything we've seen earlier? This dispute? Does it sound similar to some Solomon, right? First Kings chapter 3. Now it's a little different. It's kind of backwards, but there's some similarities. Um, first of all, um, in both stories, you've got two women who have a dispute, obviously. In both stories, one of the women has a dead son. In both stories, uh, one of the women has hoodwinked the other. And in both stories, the bereaved woman wants to kill the other one's son. 
But there's a big difference between Solomon in 1 Kings 3 and Joram in 2 Kings 6. What is it? Joram is, I mean, with Solomon, Solomon comes up with a wise answer. And how, I mean, Solomon's answer is what? Saw the baby in half. Oh, why was that a wise answer, though? Because, because, so, yeah, Solomon's wisdom is dependent on mothers acting like mothers and wanting to protect their children. You know, so Solomon has this great wise answer based on how predictable human nature is. Is there really a wise answer available in 2 Kings 6? <laughs> Hmm? Yeah, actually. Oh? I mean, oh, you're, you're, you're Jonah traveled into Nineveh for three days and preached the gospel. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the wise answer was Nineveh, Nashville, public. Okay. Okay, yes. In the bigger picture, that is the wiser answer to give. You're correct. That wasn't what I was looking for, but that's correct. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but. I mean, in the more immediate context, of course, the civil dispute can't be easily settled because these mothers aren't acting like mothers. They're... I'm sorry? Murder was involved. You know, I mean, human nature has been discarded here for cannibalism. You know, what kind of a mother eats her own child? This is uh, the, the curse of the covenant all over again. Uh... You know, that curse of the covenant is not unique to the Bible, by the way. You can find it in other ancient treaties like the Assyrians and so on. And... You know, people read this story and they say, oh, that's really, really shocking. Who does that? You know, you know, was this being exaggerated? Well, the truth is that cannibalism has been practiced even within the last century in certain communities uh, where people would sometimes uh, eat their children during famines. There's certain islands, for instance, and uh, there was a there's a good enough island in the Pacific. I'm not kidding. The name of the island is Good Enough Island. Uh, and where the natives would sometimes eat their children during a famine. And it was, there's this whole... That was within you know the last hundred years that this was happening, so it's mm -hmm. well, yes, yes, that's our idea as well. I mean, you know, it's better than killing them for that purpose, but still, it's pretty messed up. And the king doesn't have a good answer for this. He tears his clothes, and underneath his clothes, what do we see him wearing? Sackcloth. Why is Joram wearing sackcloth under his robes? Hmm? He's sad. He's mourning. You know, he's kind of keeping it secret since it's under his robes, his royal robes. He's keeping up appearances. <coughs> they don't? Yeah. Exactly. Now, this is the problem. They don't. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they don't have any answers. They, they've forgotten the Lord. This is what happens when you leave the Lord, when you forget the Lord, and run away from Him. This is the God's covenant coming back with a vengeance. And all the people standing around, they see the king is wearing sackcloth and his royal robes, and you know. Now there may be something to the idea that you know the king. Oh well, I'm wearing sackcloth. I might be petitioning God for deliverance. You've seen, we've seen Ahab wearing sackcloth, for instance, in 1 Kings 21. Sighing of mourning. He would petition God. God have mercy on him. And you know, the Lord said, we'll see how Ahab has humbled himself before me. But then Joram says something that says, you know, may God do so to me and more if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. Because if Joram has been petitioning God, and he has been waiting on God, then, well, God hasn't been fast enough for him. Uh, and I'm done waiting. I'm no longer going to take the route that Ahab took in 1 Kings 21. Instead, I'm going to take the route that Mom took, and Jezebel took in 1 Kings 19, and kill the prophet. Why, why, why kill Elisha? What's that got to do? What, what, what's, what? That yes. Yeah. Especially with Oh, your fault. 
Unfortunately, that mentality did not stay on the schoolyard. Uh, you know, today the worst crime you can commit in any context is apparently judging other people and being a snitch. But that's you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it, I guess you know here he he blames Elisha. <laughs> Um, he wants to remove his head. Since donkey's heads are selling, he's going to try to make a donkey out of Elisha. I mean, will removing Elisha's head solve anything? No. Uh, but here's another question, too. What happens when people try to kill Elisha? It usually doesn't go well, right? What happened in the very last story that we read? Yeah. <laughs> That was Second Kings one, where Elijah, where they, uh, Ahaziah sent messengers to take Elijah by force. But yeah, I mean that's another. Yeah, that's an example of why you don't try to arrest prophets against their will. Um, you know, and it's the same thing. I was thinking more immediately in Second Kings six, the Arameans are like, Elisha's telling the king our battle plan. Let's go get him, and they send their whole army to get him, and they get blinded. It, that never works. Trying to arrest the prophet never works. I mean, even when Jesus is arrested in the garden. You know, it ain't because he couldn't have gotten out of the situation. He could have summoned an army of angels to defend him, just as surely as Elijah could have summoned, had summoned fire from heaven. You know, Jesus has a different purpose in mind. But again, we've got to ask, how will Elisha not see this coming? This is the prophet who has been telling Joram the Ben-Hadad's battle plans over and over. You know, the very words that the king of Aram spoke in his bedroom. And now the king of Israel goes... That's it. I've had it. I'm going to go get Elisha. Is Elisha really not going to hear that coming? Well, in verse 32, um, let's pick up here. In verse 32, and somebody read down to 7 verse 2. This is not a great chapter division at all. Okay. Okay. Yes. The messenger came down to him and he said that he would be the messenger. The messenger came down to him and he said, well, no, I... It makes the con this is again where you know context trumps any kind of grammar that you would uh, get into. In this case, the complaint against God is not likely to come from Elisha. It's likely to come from the king's messenger. Uh, behold, this evil is, and the fact that Elisha responds to it in seven verse one again tells you the order of the dialogue. It's the messenger that says what the statement in verse thirty three, and it's Elisha that says the statement in verse one. I mean, my version says the messenger came down to him and he said. Behold, this evil is from the Lord. You know, the closest antecedent for... Yeah, the closest antecedent to he is the messenger. So, Okay, well... Um, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, so, Elisha is sitting in the house with the elders when the messenger comes. And uh, just as is prone to happen when Joram sends for Elisha, Elisha insults him. He calls him a son of a murderer. Which is true, actually. Uh, Joram is no different from his father. Whenever he, things get bad, he makes up his mind he's going to kill the prophet. We saw this in 1 Kings 18 when Elijah called for a drought and Ahab said, oh, you know, he starts going from nation to nation and 
banging on their doors and saying, give up the prophet, which, you know, making them swear that Elijah was not hiding among them. So determined to get to Elijah. It's the same thing here. Joram has, no, has not really changed anything from his father, even though, you know, there seems to be some attempt at reform in 2 Kings 3. It doesn't appear that he has been successful at that. And so Elisha has the elders shut the door and hold it shut. Um, and then the messenger speaks on the king's behalf. This evil is from Yahweh. Why should I wait for Yahweh any longer? Let's ask something about that message there for a minute. Is this evil from the Lord? Everything that's happening here. No. I mean, it's like Amos 3 says, with the calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? No, that's pretty clear what we see here. All right. It was a result of their act. Well, yeah, sure, it's a consequence of their sins. You know, the Lord is inflicting punishment as a consequence of their sins. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and that, so there's a half of it. Half of what Joram's messenger says is correct. This evil is from Yahweh. But then the second thing he says is, why should I wait for Yahweh any longer? Is that correct? It's not really a statement. It's a question. But is the sentiment behind the question correct? <laughs> Obviously not. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, Joram, he's got one idea right. They wouldn't be in the mess in Samaria if God had not taken their whole world and turned it topsy-turvy. Of course, that wouldn't have happened if they hadn't taken their whole world in the first place and turned it topsy-turvy by rebelling against the Lord. Yeah. You know, I mean, how despairing is it when we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and there's no clear reprieve from suffering? Now, what do we do in those times when we've waited and waited and waited, and there's no resolution to the problem that's been inflicted on us? Do we give up? Do we cease to wait on the Lord? You know... Right, increase our faith. What would, would it be a shame? It would be a huge shame to give up one day before deliverance hits. Right? That's what Joram is about to do. He's about to give up one day before God fixes the whole mess. Uh, you know, I mean, what a shame it would be to abandon the faith one day before Christ returns. That would be terrible, and have a lot of egg on our face then. But was, and that's what Joram's doing, and the. You know, this is the implicit reason here why you need to trust God and not give up on Him. Because really, the next day could be the day of deliverance. It could be today. If you really want it. Well, I mean... It... Right. Well, absolutely. It, you know, I mean, there's a passage in Daniel where Daniel talks, uh, Daniel chapter 12, you know... At the end of the book talks about all you know this period of suffering uh, where the abomination of desolation is set up and all these other different things and the regular sacrifice is abolished the abomination is set up and that will be 1,290 days which you know I'm not going to get into the symbolism of that number in verse Daniel 12 verse 11 but you know that that they're setting the time period of suffering here in verse 12 he says how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to 1,335 days. You know, a lot of people, again, want to try to dissect that number and make it mean something symbolic. But the main point is that, you know, the person who waits longer than the suffering, that's the one who was blessed. The one who keeps waiting and attains to a time period longer than the appointed time of suffering, that's the one who the Lord will, be, will give blessing to. You know, so whether one day or a thousand years, don't give up is the point. You know, you wait for the Lord, and you outweigh your suffering. That's a challenge, certainly. But that's what Joram is called. Joram is not willing to do that here. And, you know, why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Well, Elisha says, because, well, you technically only have to wait one more day because the Lord's going to fix this tomorrow. 
In fact, Elisha's prediction here, on the very next day, fine flour will sell for one shekel a, uh, a sea, and barley will sell for half shekel a sea. Now, that's not, that's not cheap, cheap, cheap prices. That's not like if you were to go to the gas tank and get like 10 cents a gallon or something. Um, but, what, I mean, you know, a sea is about seven and a half quarts. A shekel is about one month's wage. So it's still pretty up there. Exactly. Right, exactly. It's clearly a reversal of their fortunes. And that's the point. The, um, you know, the, I mean, you know, Babylonian sources indicate that the normal price for barley was about, you know, one shekel for 100 quarts. That's almost seven. Uh, so, I mean, Elisha is talking about prices that are still sevenfold the normal kind. But it's way better than being able to get, not get food. Uh, I mean, five seahs of flour for the current price of dove's dung? That's a huge windfall. Uh, the, the, not only that, people will be able to eat something edible for a change. That would kind of be nice. Things will start to return to normal, and it'll happen tomorrow. Well, of course, this messenger, this royal officer, who uh, happens to be there, he's a little skeptical. Why is he skeptical? Yeah? You know, I mean, we couldn't possibly reverse that in that short a time. I mean, even if God were to make windows in heaven... It couldn't happen. You know, it's like the same mess that we saw at the end of chapter 4 when they only had 20 loaves of barley and somebody said, you know, should I set this before 100 men? Well, Elisha says, the Lord says you'll have enough. And sure enough, they had enough according to the word of the Lord. How much is, how much is enough? How much is go there going to be? Well, however much God says is enough. That's the bottom line. Um... And so the impatience of the king is matched by the skepticism of his officer. Even if Yahweh made windows in heaven, how could it happen? And Elisha says, you know, here's what, I'll, I'll take your skepticism and I'll say, you know what, you get to see it. You get to see it with your own eyes. You're not going to get to eat it, but you're going to get to see it. Of course, uh, Elisha's being a little cryptic here. We're going to see just what that means at the end of the chapter for this uh, skeptical officer. Um, he winds up dead at the end of the story. Spoiler alert. Uh, a good chunk of this chapter actually is a warning about despising the prophetic word, you know. Which, I mean, raises all sorts of questions for us. Do we find the promise of God incredible? You know, the Lord promises that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And you look at the world today, when so many do not do that. You know, does it raise skepticism? If the Lord could make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? Well, yes. Because God said so. That's why. And though there will be many people in that day who will see it. They do not benefit from it. So let's not make ourselves part of that group of skeptics. But rather let us trust again in the promises of God. The salvation of God will mean judgment for the one who mocks God's word. Alright, now we have uh, how God accomplishes deliverance. Uh, let's read verses 3 through 11 of chapter 7. Somebody read verses 3 through 11.
Okay. So, now we've had the story of the ten lepers in the Gospels. Well, here's the story of the four lepers in the book of Second Kings. Uh, their situation is horrible, again, because these lepers, they, they're allowed to share in the famine that's going on in Samaria. They're just not allowed to be part of anything else that goes on in Samaria because of all the cleanness laws. And I guess, um, you know, there's, there's an interesting scenario where the leper laws are being kept. Nothing else is being kept. Um, and now, there's kind of what, what is interesting about all of this is that the lepers are the ones who herald Israel's deliverance. What's significant about that? You know, I mean, God uses you know weak people frequently to accomplish His purpose. He uses the weak to shame the strong. Um, there's some a lot of similarities, actually. At least I think there's a lot of similarities between this and. You know, the fact that these lepers, who would not normally be thought of as uh, anyone credible, discover this empty camp, and the fact that in the Gospels it is the women who discover the empty tomb. Uh, you know, they, the lepers were considered unclean. In the ancient world, women were not considered reliable witnesses, and yet God chose both to be the foolish first witnesses to his salvation. Um, both are apprehensive about going, uh, the lepers are apprehensive about going to the camp. The women are apprehensive about going to the tomb because they're wondering who's going to roll the stone away from the door for them. Uh, the Arameans are frightened off by an approaching army. The soldiers at the tomb are frightened off by the appearance of an angel. The camp and the tomb are found empty. Uh, the lepers initially keep silent. The women initially keep silent, Mark 16, verse 8. But then they report the good news. Uh, you know, and on and on we could go as a result of the salvation of the empty tomb or the empty camp. Salvation results. So there's kind of that little uh, thing there. These lepers, of course, they get up and, you know, then the dilemma is, you know, if we go into the city, we're going to die. We're going to starve to death. If we stay in the gate, we're going to starve to death. The Arameans might kill us, but they might feed us too and not have us starve to death. So let's go with the the one where we have a chance of at least surviving. And so they defect to the Aramean camp. And now there, there's kind of a little bit of an of a ambiguous wording in verse 6, which suggests and seems to imply that the Arameans, they hear the lepers coming, but they mistake it for the sound of this giant Egyptian and Hittite army, and they run for their lives as a result of it. Um, there's actually a word play between the word for leper, metzoraim, and the word for Egyptian, Mitzrayim, uh, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. It's like the enemy mishears who's supposed to be coming, and you know, in this case, they really do mishear. They, they draw a complete wrong conclusion. The Hittites and the Egyptians, they're coming up on us, and we've got to run. And they don't even pack up the camp. They just leave the horses. They leave the tents. I don't know why you leave the horses. Wouldn't it be easier to get away on the horses? But uh, they not thinking very clearly in this battle. They run for their lives, and... And we find out later that they've just abandoned their equipment on the road to the Jordan. This is how God accomplishes deliverance. He strikes irrational fear into the hearts of the enemies of his people. And so we have the situation where this military camp of the enemy that has besieged Israel all this time is now being plundered by lepers. And at first, you know, they just eat and drink and they steal silver and gold and they hide it and they keep coming back. But at some point... They get the idea in their heads and they realize, oh, you know, this isn't right. We should probably tell people about this. They're all starving in the city and we're getting bread and celebrating. They have good news, but they're not reporting it to anyone. If they wait till morning, they'll be punished. So they opt to do the right thing. They go to tell the king's household. They tell the gatekeepers of the city. The gatekeepers tell the king's household. In verse 12, the king tells them it's a trap. And in verse 15, the messengers come back and tell him about the empty camp. Um, in verses 12 to 15, of course, the king is a little suspicious. The king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will now tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know that we're hungry. Therefore, they've gone from the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we will capture them alive and get into the city. One of his servants said, Please, let some men take five of the horses which remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they will be in any case, like all the multitude of Israel who are left in it. Behold, they will be uh, in any case, like all the multitude of Israel who have already perished. So let's send and see. 
So they took two chariots with horses, and the king sent after the army of the Arameans, saying, Go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan, and behold, all the way which was full of clothes and equipment which the Arameans had thrown away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. So we kind of see the same recurring theme throughout Kings over and over. The king is paralyzed by fear. He thinks it's a trap. There's nothing we can do. And it's one of these servants who we're not told the name of who pipes up with the right answer and says, Oh, you know, well, let's use common sense for a minute. We're all going to die anyway. Why don't you send out a few messengers who are going to die anyway and see if the lepers are telling the truth. Let's take a chance on this. Uh, Kind of like the lepers themselves taking a chance just by going out to the Arameans in the first place. And so the, uh, um, the king permits this mission. The messengers discover there's a whole trail of clothes and equipment that they just dropped in their attempt to get away. But there's no question it's the real source of this. God has delivered his people. God brought the Aramean army there and now God has destroyed the Aramean army and driven them away. You know, similar to how God later destroys Sennacherib's army in chapter 19, as we're going to see later. Now, so, in all of that, I guess we could ask this question, why is it that even though Israel's broken God's laws so much, and they've had this siege inflicted on them, clearly as a consequence of their own sin, and it doesn't really appear like they've repented in this story. So why does God deliver them? Show His power and glory? Let Him remain a little longer? It's like Pharaoh, you know? I mean, His purpose, I raise you up. God, Did God show mercy to Pharaoh? I mean, Pharaoh would frequently petition God and say, oh, take the plague away from me. And the Lord would take the plague away. And he would harden his heart once again and not let the people go. And here it's the same thing with Joram. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Well, the Lord takes away the famine, the siege, and the calamity from him. Of course, does Joram repent? Does he change his ways? No. No. His heart is still hardened, and his end is coming. We're, we're going to get to that when we get to chapter 9. Uh, so his days are slowly passing away in this story. Uh, and we finally come to the end of this, the uh, fulfillment of the prophetic word in verses 16 through 20. Let's talk about that. Uh, somebody read verses 16 through the end of the chapter. Is it just me, or is this text really rubbing in the fact that Elisha said this and he died because Elisha said this, that's why he died? It's just kind of repeating this fact over and over and over. Why do you think that is? I. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, more than any other, uh, this may just be my, um, just the, I may be wrong about this, but my impression is more than any other book in the Old Testament, the book of Kings, First and Second Kings, places huge emphasis on the fact of God's, the fulfillment of God's words. Every time somebody makes a prediction and that prediction comes to, fa- to pass, the book of Kings, more than most other books, takes great pains to highlight it and says, this is in fulfillment of what God said all those, all those verses ago or all those chapters ago. Uh, you know, there's a great stress placed upon that. And it's here, true here in chapter 7. It's true in 1 Kings chapter 13 with the man of God from Judah and all those uh, lions pouncing on people. It's true in 1 Kings chapter 20 when Ahab is engaging in all those campaigns against the Arameans. 
It's true of Micaiah who says that if you do return from Ramoth Gilead, the Lord has not spoken by me. You know, according to the word of the Lord, over and over again. You know, it's like the book of Kings is trying to drive that home. It is not the king's word that rules the world. It is God's word that determines how events will unfold. And thus, these kings in the book of Kings are not really the king because their words are not done. They give orders and people don't follow them. But when God gives orders, when God gives a statement, when God says something's going to happen, it happens. And that's a huge, huge uh, point that the book of Kings really tries to drive home and emphasize. You know, Elisha's predictions are all fulfilled here. Uh, the people plunder the Aramean camp. The food prices are sold at exactly what Elisha said they would be in chapter 7 and verse 1. A seah of fine flour is sold for one shekel. Two seahs of barley are sold for one shekel according to the word of Yahweh. Verse 16. But that wasn't the only thing Elisha predicted. So Joram puts his royal officer in charge of the gate where they're selling this stuff. You know, he's going to put his trusted administrator to handle all of this, and then that royal officer is subsequently trampled to death in what is perhaps the worst Black Friday sale ever. I, I mean, all that, you know, a mad rush to purchase flour. You'd think they were hungry or something. Gail? Yeah, oh yeah, this is also the king's fault, you know. Um, Yeah, you know, he causes this guy to die. I mean, was that the, what the king had in mind? You know, maybe the king is like, well, I'll show Elisha. I'll put this guy in charge. He'll surely get to eat something, right? And lo and behold, in trying to do that, he would result in the fulfillment of the prophetic word. Um, in any case, that's not necessarily the point it makes. But the text, I mean, you know, it's in the same chapter. And the text is all in your face about it. Oh, by the way, in case you forgot what happened in verses 1 and 2, Elisha said... You'll see it, but you won't eat it. That's what happens. I mean, it just repeats the quote verbatim in verses 18 and 19. The entire exchange is re-rehearsed. And then it's explicitly fulfilled in the fact that this officer gets trampled to death in the marketplace. Just as the man of God said, repeated three times. The nameless officer is dead. That's repeated twice. By the way, you know, here's an example of a servant who is not given a name who doesn't have all the answers in the book of Kings. He's kind of the exception to that rule. Why, why does this guy have to die? Why, why, why does this guy have to die? He doubted the word of the Lord. He mocked the word of the Lord, ultimately. You know, it's like, you know, the problem, similar to the problem in chapter 2 where the lads of Bethel are mocking the prophet. Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And then they're killed for that. And people say that's harsh. No, that's the point. That's the point. You don't mock God's word. You think it's bad to, you know, mock the statutes of the kings of the earth. You should be more worried about the king of the universe who created the world. Don't mock his laws. Don't make a mockery of his word. Because when he says something, it's done. That ought to cause us all to fear. Not to fear man, but to fear God. Mm, and then this is, a, this is a serious lesson. All right. You know, in the midst of God's great deliverance, you know, this is a great time for the city. They're, they're getting to eat. The city's coming back to life. Great deliverance! But that doesn't mean... That judgment is out of the picture. The free gift of grace is available to all in Samaria. But not all could eat of it. Because not all believed the word of God. Not all took it seriously. Is that just an Old Testament thing? Nope. What does it Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25 says? Hebrews 12 verse 25. Yeah, God expects His word to be taken seriously. Do not refuse Him who is speaking. 
You know, I mean, and he kind of makes a comparison. If it was that way in Old Testament times, it's actually more so that way now. He warns us from heaven even now. You know, I mean, that we have more reason now to believe that God rules this world than ever before because we live in an age where Jesus Christ has been crucified and raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God. That is the kingdom of God come into this world. That is something that we ought to be submitting to. We don't mock God's word. May God help us not to do that. This guy, he's in the Bible, not just to provide an entertaining story about you know, what happens when you, uh, you get too close to the grain, to a mad rush for grain. He's here as a cautionary tale for all of us about what happens when you don't take the Word of God seriously. All right, well, that's the, the end of chapter 7. Does anybody have any last bit uh, thoughts, comments, or observations before we conclude? It's, you know, I mean, in verse 33... Hmm? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. I mean, it's important to read... Again, it's a, this is one of those instances where, you know, chapter divisions in the Bible are... Uh, can be, I mean, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. And this is one instance where it's clearly misleading because the story begins in verse 24 of chapter 6. And, you know, if we read the narrative continuously, we can see that. But, like, we put the chapter division in the break in the middle of the conversation. So, uh, that's, a, that's a real challenge. We've got to be careful about, you know, letting those things dictate uh, how we break up our study. So, um, but anyhow, yeah, it, it's... A, there's a lot that can be learned from this about waiting on the Lord, about the danger of, uh, you know, how God's justice uh, is implemented. Certainly there's a lot of questions, I guess, that get raised. Uh, you know, why does he relent? I mean, it looks like he's going to destroy them. But he relents at the last second. And we as the reader are kind of, wait, what? Well, uh, what happened to what Elijah said about the house of Ahab? Or Ahijah said about Israel being destroyed? Well, no, we've still got... The Lord's not done with them yet. He is... you know, And we might say the same thing today. And when is the Lord going to return and end all the destruction and the suffering in the world? Is He not coming back? Is He slow about His promise? Well, 2 Peter 3 says the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness. He's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. It's the same thing here. You know, the reason the Lord relents concerning calamity is because... There's still people in Israel that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. There's still a few people left we can maybe get. So he's trying to give them yet another chance. This is yet another wake-up call for the nation. Will they heed it? Tune in next week to find out. All right. Thank you all for your attention. We'll pick up with chapter 8 on Sunday.